I am going to discuss the basal groups of chordates and the basal groups of vertebrates, meaning the earliest branching groups in um, both the chordata phylum and the vertebrate clade underneath that. Um, here's a partial animal phylogeny just to orient you to where we are. Here's chordata. This is the phylum. It is in metazoa, which are all animals. Eumetazoa, it has true tissues, including muscle and nervous tissue, the most uh, important animal tissues. Um, bilateria, so chordates are bilateral symmetry. They are triploblastic with their mesoderm coming from the, uh, or their muscles coming from the mesoderm and they are um, uh, cephalized, meaning that they have concentrations of neurons anteriorly, and then they're in deuterostomia, which is a clade uh, of all deuterostome type development, but it's mostly known because uh, the genetic data clearly puts the hemichordates, the echinodermata, and the chordata together in a clade there. I have a lecture that goes over deuterostomia in detail, so make sure you have looked at that. So here is deuterostomia. Uh, I don't have the hemichordates on here. They would branch with echinodermata. And you can see that in deuterostomia, these are groups that are chordates. Okay. They have these four characteristics, dorsal hollow nerve cord, the notochord, pharyngeal slits, and a muscular postanal tail. Within phylum chordata, there are many other characteristics, synapomorphies of various groups. Um, that arise, and so these would be groups that you'd need to understand the snake morphies and who has them in the phylum chordata. Um, but first, we'll just focus on these uh, here, these two groups here. Something I want to point out, based off this phylogeny, is that many chordate lineages are extinct. So all of these here, you can actually see this is a true phylogeny because it has um, timelines. So many of these groups are jawless fish. So we're going to see that we have two groups of jawless fish nowadays, the hagfish and the lampreys. But just don't get misled by thinking that our diversity today is reflective of the diversity of the clade in general, meaning that there could have been a lot more diversity in the past and extinction events have just led to the loss of that diversity. I love this, this uh, chart here. And here are our two basal chordates. You can see that they are not vertebrates. Vertebrates, the dotted line shows where that ends here. Um, they are the cephalochordates or the cephalochordata clade and the urochordata clade. All of deuterostomia, including chordata, undergo deuterostome type development. This is actually also what most arthropods do and some annelids, those are not in deuterostomia. But I just thought it was pretty cool to show you this uh, as a series of pictures of an embryo developing of a lancelet or cephalochordate. So here's the fertilized egg and then you can see it's dividing. And here's that stage that's different in um, deuterostomian and protostomy. This is radial cleavage. You can see how these four cells are stacked right on top of the um, other four cells, and that's something that's classic of deuterostomia. Tunicates and lancelets, those are the common names for the two basal chordates. Again, these have no backbone, which is why I don't split our units into invertebrates and vertebrates, because the way we do it in our class is looking at biodiversity and evolutionary relationships. And so evolutionarily, these invertebrates are more closely related to vertebrates than they are to other invertebrates. In other words, these tunicates and lancelets group with vertebrates and therefore we talk about them together. They don't have a head or skull and um, you'll remember pharyngeal slits are one of those four chordate characteristics in tunicates and lancelets those um, become filter feeding devices as adults. And you'll see that in the pictures in a moment. So you do need to know the scientific clade names. You, can't, you, know, you do need to know lancelets as well, but you gotta know cephalochordata. Uh, cephalo is head, chordata is, you know, cord means thread. So um, this is the lancelet. It's a little, 
You can see the two centimeter is this uh, scale bar here. Uh, it's sort of blade-like, buries itself in the sand. Um, and then here's its mouth. And the basically it's filter feeding. So the water comes in the mouth, you can see here, and then it's going to come back out the pharyngeal slits. Uh, as it does that, the food particles are collected and then passed into the digestive tract and then out the anus, and there's that postanal tail. Dorsal hollow nerve cord. Um, more ventral to that is the notochord. And then the pharyngeal slits, again, those are filter feeding devices. You may hear people refer to uh, lancelets as amphioxus. Something neat between the um, lancelets and the vertebrates, these are both embryonic stages, lancelets don't have a brain. Um, they have this little swelling at the front of their, um, or the anterior, I should say, of their nerve cord, um, whereas these vertebrates do have this brain. Um, the brain is in vertebrates is three regions, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. They are specified, meaning um, uh, determined by which genes are expressed in which region. Uh, they're very demarcated areas, so it's like overlapping, not overlapping, overlapping with something else, not overlapping, and so this is what makes the regions. The interesting thing is lancelets don't have any of those brain regions, but they have the gene expression, and many of those genes are expressed in the same spaces, the same places, anterior to posterior, overlapping or not. So what this tells us is that um, that gene expression overlapping, not overlapping, is, uh, and those specific genes are ancestral to both vertebrates and lancelets. And since lancelets are the first group of, of um, uh, chordates to branch, that means that this gene expression type pattern for neural development in this case uh, is a very ancient. Probably the ancestor of all chordates had some pattern like this. Uh, and so things like that allow us to say, like, well, why does the pattern here not result in a brain? Um, and uh, how did the changes happen that did result in a brain? That kind of thing. So let's look at a little clip from Your Inner Fish. It's a PBS uh, documentary series. And uh, you can see what we're talking about here in the context of a uh, real live uh, lancelet. Um, they call it amphioxus, but, but that's the cephalochordate lancelet. Studying the DNA of ancient organisms is a window into our distant past. And if you look hard enough, you can find some creatures today that haven't changed much in hundreds of millions of years. This coast is home to a relative that shows us how ancient the genetic recipe is for building our brain. Yeah, how do you know where to look? Well, except you want to go deeper than this. Meet Peter Holland, head of zoology at Oxford University in England. Right, okay. Well, we could start trying around X here. X marks the spot. X marks the spot. Let's give it a go. Right. Okay, so what do I do here? Just shake it. Shake it. You got one. <laughs> There's an amphioxus. We got any. Whoa, look at that little guy go. Hey! Just dip it in the water again, you'll see it. It'll flick around. Well, they really flick. Now you see. There he is. Hey, that's beautiful. Look at that. Which is the front? <laughs> It doesn't look like much, but this tiny creature, called Amphioxus, has much to tell us about our own brains. That is cool. Oh. <laughs> okay, that ranks is cool. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's take a look at a couple of these. So I brought this from the anatomy lab in Chicago. This is a, this is a human brain. And when I look at this, I don't find any obvious similarities to that. Deep in the genes of this animal and the development of this animal and deep in the genes of us and the development of us, there are the similarities. So if you just take a look at that. He's just moved. Oh, he twisted away. Yeah, he's they're pretty wow. active. Holy cow. Oh, that is beautiful. God, they're so clear too. You can see right yeah. through them. You know, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Amphioxus lives in the sand of the ocean floor, filtering algae out of the water. They have a simple nerve cord that runs the length of the body which ends with a tiny swelling invisible to the naked eye. If you look at the front end of this animal, you don't see it all expanded into a large skull or, or brain region. It's just pointed. We might not have similar brains, but what we do have are similar genes. 
To make the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, you need a series of control genes to tell the cells within the developing brain where they are. They map out the brain's three basic regions. Versions of the same master genes that help form our own brains are also active in amphioxus. But here, they're simply building the primitive nerve cord and the tiny swelling at its front. This means that the genetic roots of our own brains can be seen in creatures that first arose over 500 million years ago. I think it gives us a glimpse into where our brains came from, into the basic organization of um, the brain of our ancestors. I mean, I find that mind-blowing. He's jumped oh, off he's hot. Sorry. <laughs> he's going on. We have an escapee, on. sorry. He's land living. Uh, he's he's gone rogue. Yep, yeah, he's gone for the next transition. Exactly. He's, he's, he's in the Devonian now. <laughs> Eurocordata, um, the common name is tunicates, um, are the other basal group. They're second to branch off. You may also hear them referred to as sea squirts or ascidians. That's often seen in the literature. They uh, undergo metamorphosis. Their embryo, or, or their larval, I should say, their larval stage looks very similar to the lancelet, which looks very similar to like the idealized chordate. Um, it has the dorsal hollow nerve cord, and then underneath that, the notochord, postanal tail and there's the pharynx or pharyngeal slits. And, uh, oh, so sort of looks like a tadpole. Uh, I have a little clip of video to show you of the larvae. Has chordate features like a tail with a stiff rod called a notochord and a nerve cord like our spinal cord. So after metamorphosis, uh, the body structure changes incredibly, and you have this sessile, meaning it does not move, um, form of the tunicate, uh, where it basically has its body and organs uh, inside this sort of sheath here, uh, they call it a tunic, see? And um, tunic you might also be familiar with, it's a, a loose shirt, so a lot of um, people would wear a tunic over leggings, let's say, or I think of like, Robin Hood or the Renaissance, the men wore those loose, flowy kind of shirts, those are tunics. And that's, uh, you'll see in the video how this looks very much like that. Uh, and so the, uh, again, the pharyngeal slits turn into filter feeding structures. So uh, the sea squirt comes from how this guy feeds. The water flows in the incurrent siphon, uh, and then it'll come through and get filtered through the pharyngeal slits. The fo food particles get passed on to the digestive system, the water like it gets squirted out the excurrent siphon and then any leftover food particles also go out there as well. Uh, and so that's the name sea squirt and um, let's see a video of that. Aside from that little bit of trivia, tunicates come in a really wide variety of both colors and shapes. Some of them are isolated individuals, while others are colonial, and many of them actually have a free swimming stage as well where basically they look like a tadpole. They're called tunicates because of their tunic-like shape. Eurocordata or tunicates are also interesting um, looking at evolutionary development. They have genes that are homologous to or um, equivalent to our uh, vertebrate um, heart genes, thyroid genes, and uh, insulin-like genes. But tunicates don't actually have a heart or a thyroid or pancreas producing insulin. So that tells us again that these kind of genes are ancestral kind of genes, and then we can understand how they do one thing in one organism, like are part of you know making a heart, uh, versus not that and do something else in the tunicates. 
Tunicates are also interesting genetically because they have uh, lost Hox genes compared to other groups. Obviously, they still develop. Uh, and they actually, some of the nerve impulse genes are not there as well. So we can study those losses in the, the tunicate lineage and see what consequences it has for the development of that organism. Now we move to the vertebrates. Vertebrates are chordates with vertebrae. Vertebrae are uh, uh, backbone components. Vertebrates also have uh, two or more sets of Hox genes. They have a, uh, a true head with an elaborate skull, um, sensory features on that head like eyes. We call them craniates because of the skull. They also have red blood cells with hemoglobin in it to carry oxygen very efficiently. They have kidneys. They have a heart that pumps blood around. They're a closed circulatory system. And then pharyngeal slits of vertebrates can either, if it's aquatic vertebrates, meaning all the fish groups, um, those pharyngeal slits will turn into gills for gas exchange. If it's the tetrapod groups, that's amphibians, reptiles, including birds and mammals, those pharyngeal slits turn into parts of the neck, ears, and jaw. And all of these features basically uh, increase the ability of these vertebrates to be good predators as well as escape being prey, as in don't get eaten. <laughs> Helps them eat better and not get eaten. And you saw that same idea with cephalization just in bilaterates. And now it's even more so with the vertebrae and the delivering of oxygen and uh, gills and all those sorts of features. Neural crest cells are also important in craniates, the ones with the skulls, which are all the vertebrates. They're this little group of cells that um, sit right dorsal. So here's the back, here's the ne neural tube. That's the dorsal hollow nerve tube. You can see actually it goes from a flat sheet and rolls up into a tube and detaches from the uh, skin, if you will, the outside. And these neural crest cells sit right in between the two. And they actually migrate, as in crawl around, uh, move to different parts of the body. Depends on the type of vertebrate as to what they form uh, exactly, but they are part of the cells that help make um, portions of the skull. Which makes sense that if the craniates slash vertebrates are known for their skulls, uh, then these neural crest cells uh, would allow them to have that. So here we are in the phylogeny, chordates, and here's our vertebrates, so Mixini and down. And remember, I don't have to draw Mixini at the top. In fact, I don't even have to draw cephalochordata at the top. So please don't remember your phylogenies by like what goes you know, top to bottom. That's not how you read a phylogeny. You need to know the branching. So what would you do? You'd know that if you're just walking along the lineage, when you got to the first node, whatever branched off first would be cephalochordata lancelets. So I'm just reminding you, making sure you know the branching, not the order, because that doesn't mean anything, just the branching. Okay. So there's the vertebrates. The vertebral column is the synapomorphy. You can see here's where it arises in the ancestor, and everybody that derives from that ancestor is a vertebrate. This is the phylogeny. So here, we're just doing just the vertebrates now. And we will look at the first two groups, uh, or the most basal vertebrates, as I call them, uh, Mixini, or the hagfish, and Petromyzontida, the lampreys. These guys are called cyclostomes. And I put jaws on here because you can see they are before jaws arise. And in fact, we call them the jawless fish. So they were our first quote unquote fish group, the jawless fish. That is because they lack hinged jaws. They also lack paired fins. So like lampreys have a fin, a dorsal fin on their back, um, but they don't have the paired fins on their sides. You know, the ones that like you think of a, 
like a goldfish moves its, or Nemo, <laughs> clownfish moves its uh, fins back and forth to swim, or the shark has the two fins out to the side. Um, these guys don't have those. They don't have true vertebrae. Like if you have a lamprey or, or a hagfish, you can just cut right through it. If you had, you know, an organism with a, a true backbone, you're not going to be able to do that as easily, not with just like a scalpel. They have most of their support as adults um, from a, uh, you could call it the notochord or a rem or a, a cartilage rod that was the notochord, not from vertebrae. We know that they group with vertebrates though, because of genetic evidence, and um, we call them the cyclostomes. The stome or stoma means uh, mouth. And cyclo is, I think of it like circle, so circle mouth, because they have no jaw. Mixini, common name hagfishes, are deep sea scavengers. You will see this in a video in a moment. Um, they're classically known for their massive slime production. You can see that here, and we'll also see that in a little video too. They have these slime glands on their skin. Um, the skin here, as well as in lampreys, no scales. Um, sometimes people call these slime eels, but that's wrong. <laughs> An eel is a ray finned fish with bones that are well developed, like a perch kind of fish. Uh, that's what eels are. These are not. Um, th these are actually hagfish, but they do produce slime in large quantities. Um, you can see they're pretty flexible. This is preserved one in a jar. Um, inside their mouth, they have these keratin type tooth-like formations. Um, they have little ears and eyes and a small brain anteriorly. There's its, its uh, yeah, mouth here. And often when you um, get a uh, purse or a wallet or a belt or something made out of, quote, eel skin, it's not actually eel, it's often hagfish. Especially if you feel it and it has no scales, <laughs> then it's actually probably a hagfish um, uh, kind of leatherish type material. So let's look at the hagfish uh, defense with the um, production of that slime, as well as their scavenging on the bottom of the ocean.
The last group in this lecture is the, are the Petromyzontida, common name lampreys. These guys do metamorphosis. So in their larval stage, they really look a lot like the lancelet, where it's just like a little blade organism that buries in the uh, sediment, like on, you know, in the sand of the water. Filter feeds, kind of just stays there. Um, as an adult, after metamorphosis, they often migrate for spawning or reproduction. Um, they are also usually parasitic, most species, and you can see this mouth here. Uh, it does look like a parasite mouth. Uh, it has these razor tongue, rasping tongue, and these um, kind of teeth formations that can attach to the side of a fish, slice it open with the tongue, and then uh, suck the bodily fluids and blood and such out of the fish. Uh, usually doesn't kill the fish right away. It'll just be attached to the fish for quite some time. Um, you can see here that there are the gill slits. So these guys, um, that's what the pharyngeal slits turned into. And um, clearly jawless here. So both those uh, Mixini and the Petromyzontida are the two types of jawless fish, the earliest two diverging groups of vertebrates.